Disciple Up number 232, Should Worship Make Me Uncomfortable? This is Disciple Up, the Disciple Empowering Podcast, where psychology, science, the real world, sin, self, and culture meet head on, and scripture rules. If you're a follower of Christ looking to grow or looking for some biblical answers, then get ready because it's time to Disciple Up. Hey everybody, welcome to the podcast. This is your host, Louie. Glad that you're with me today. And let me start off by addressing the um, elephant in the room, so to speak, (laughs) which today is the fact that it's really blowing a lot outside. A lot of wind, and when the wind blows from a certain direction, uh, it hits the awning over the window in one of the windows in my bedroom and rattles like there's no tomorrow. Uh, I think you're probably going to be able to hear it, but I'm not positive. I did check my mic earlier and you could hear it. So uh, if you hear this booming, thundering, whatever, no, there's not a war going on outside. It's not the end of the world. It's the stupid metal awning over the window uh, that always rattles like that and if you're wondering why don't you fix it i rent so that's up to my landlord not me so there you go all right so just to give you a heads up on that one now today's topic is um well it's an interesting topic i think for me to discuss i think it's something that is a good thing to think about occasionally and it flows out of a conversation i had uh, yesterday, actually, or the day before, uh, I think it was yesterday, with a friend of mine about worship. <clears throat> this friend of mine um, was talking about the church that he goes to now, and he's gone to for, oh gosh, probably seven or eight years now. He came from a Baptist kind of church, and he went into a liturgical church um, when his Baptist church died. And he was talking about, you know, he wanted to go down to the coast, and there's a big old Calvary Chapel down there he used to love to go to and whatever. And then he said, he said, ah, you know, I that's 45 minutes of singing those stupid, he hates modern music, worship songs over and over again, and then the 45-minute sermon. I said, I, I'm past all that. He said, I, I like to, my church where you got the liturgy and you got the, you know, short little message, and it's it's very comfortable. It makes me feel comfortable. It reminds me of my childhood when he was not a Christian, but he was, uh, and not a Catholic, but he went to Catholic school, which included, of course, going to Mass. So I challenged him on that, and we had kind of a little discussion about it. But it brings up the the larger question of, should worship really make me feel comfortable? Should it make me feel uncomfortable? Is either one of those a good thing or a bad thing? Does it kind of depend How do you answer that? Well, I was doing some research on it, and I came across um, a website, and there's a link to it in the show notes, which is available at discipleup.org, by the way. And yeah, I should also say this. If you want to get in touch with me, uh, you can do so by emailing me, louie, L-O-U-I-E, at discipleup.org, or go to the webpage, or go to the Facebook page, sorry, um, which is facebook.com slash discipleup. Uh, DiscipleUp.org is my homepage on the web, and uh, you can find links to all the podcasts, all my articles, all my uh, monthly columns that I haven't really written in a long time. They used to be monthly anyway. (laughs) Um, And books that I've self-published on Amazon, all that kind of stuff. Videos, etc., etc. That's DiscipleUp.org for that. And in the show notes there for episode 232, which is this one, you will find a link to where I'm pulling some of these things from, which I'm going to read to you here in just a sec. Because they, at the core, yes questions, and then people give you their answers. So here's the question that was asked. And this is um, back in 2019, so it's not that old. Going to church makes me uncomfortable, but I want a good relationship with God. Should I just go? Now, I've chosen three answers for us. I could have chosen a lot more. Um, so there's a whole, you know, there there was a series of answers to this. Not like hundreds of them, but there were quite a few. Um, and, you know, 
this may sound a little uh oh man listen to that go it sounds like gunfire to you guys i'll bet you <laughs> if you can hear it uh <laughs> this may sound a little arrogant or a little um you know kind of like i'm looking down my nose at people when i say this and i don't mean it that way but regardless here you go this this is why you should be really careful who you go to for advice. <laughs> You'll see what I mean in a second. Um, because, you know, these are just some some really, really not greatest pieces of, of advice I've ever read. The first one comes from Nathan Ziegler. He answered this on May 6, 2019. Nathan says, quote, If I were you, I would start looking into other churches and other denominations to see if I could find one where I was more comfortable. The discomfort you feel might be God's signal that this particular church is not right or good for you. God meets people where they are at and tries to guide them down the path towards his kingdom. Sometimes a congregation, pastor, or church is focused on a spot where an individual is not. In such a case, it is best to find another church. It helps a relationship with God to attend church. However, it is possible to have a relationship without church. If you decide not to attend church, you will need to be open to God in other ways. You will also need a support system outside a congregation. Parentheses, good to have anyway, but vital if you are not getting any support from a congregation. Close parentheses. Best wishes. I hope you find what you are looking for. Let your sense of discomfort and comfort be your guide. And stay open to messages from God in other areas of your life. If you want a relationship with God, you will have one. Peace. Unquote. Okay. This is actually probably the best of the uh, of the advice you're about to get here. Um, and it's, you know, obviously I have a problem with this. Uh, first of all, when he says, the discomfort you feel might be God's signal that this church isn't right for you. Yeah, it might be that. It might be God's signal that this is where you belong and that you're being challenged and stretched. And that's what God wants to do is get you out of your lazy old comfort zone and do something. It might be that anchovies on the pizza you ate last night. I mean, it might be a lot of things. (laughs) So, but there's no particular reason that I can think of. There's no logical reason or evidence to think that just because I'm uncomfortable, that's God's way of saying, hey, go find another church. You'll notice there's no reference to scripture in this answer. There's no reference to Jesus, actually, even in this answer, really. So it's okay. Um, And when he says it helps a relationship with God to attend church, however, it is possible to have a relationship without church. Well, sure, it, you know, all things are possible, right? Uh, not all things, actually. But most things, many things, many more than we might think. But if if church is a take-it-or-leave-it thing, which is what most modern Americans view it as, then why did Jesus die to create it? Why is he called the head of his body, the church? Why are we told in Scripture to meet together? Why do we see in the book of Acts that early Christians did this um, all the time? If it's just something you could do, but you don't have to do. And by the way, when he says, uh, you will also need a support system outside of a congregation. Well, (laughs) so then you're actually creating your own congregation by yourself with your friends and whoever these people are that you're going to have this support network, right? What do you think that is? So there you go. So yeah, this answer is not horrible. It's not really good, but it's not horrible. So good for you, Nathan. Next answer here is Barry Davis. It was updated on May 7th. Who knows what it said originally? Here's his answer. Quote, if going to church makes you uncomfortable, then stop going. You cannot buy a relationship with God by enduring discomfort. Otherwise, you would be able to buy a better one by scourging yourself. Parentheses, whipping your body with a chain that's got spikes on. Close parentheses. 
and that idea is not on trend anymore, even amongst the most devout. My advice is get back in your comfort zone. Give the religious rituals a rest and then see what happens to your relationship with God. It may improve. It may stay the same. It may even disappear altogether. Whatever it is, you will not have been forced into it by the expectations of other churchgoers. You were talking about your, all in caps, relationship with God after all, unquote. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Wow. Well, of course, you can't buy a relationship with God by enduring discomfort. You also can't buy one by being comfortable. So I don't know where that takes us. And and I love this. He says, you, you, uh, you, know, you can't buy one by scourging yourself, whipping your body with a chain that's got spikes on it. Um, and then he says, quote, and that idea is not on trend anymore, even amongst the most devout, unquote. <laughs> really? You think so? Uh, and actually, that's not even precisely true. There are people still doing that. I don't know that they use chains. Scourge is actually the Roman scourge that Jesus was scourged with. Didn't use a chain. It was long strips of leather to which bits of chain or sharp you know, pieces of metal or something were attached. So... He doesn't quite know what a scourge is, but that's all right. The point is, it's really, when was it on trend? And what does being on trend, which I assume means trendy, I'm old, what do I know? Um, what does that have to do with this? If it was on trend, would he suggest that you do it? <laughs> I hope not. Ay, yay, yay. This is why you need to be careful from whom you take advice. I'm sure Barry, B A R R I E, by the way, Davis, is very well intentioned. I'm sure he means well, but this answer, good Lord. Um, it's amazing. <sighs> and then he says something even more amazing to me. He says, Quote, get back in your comfort zone, unquote. Really? Do we want to be encouraging people to just stay in their comfort zone? Has anybody ever accomplished anything worth doing by staying in their comfort zone? I don't think so. And I love it. He says, quote, then see what happens at after taking a break from church. Quote, see what happens to your relationship with God. It may improve. It may stay the same. It may even disappear altogether. Whatever it is, you will not have been forced into it by the expectations of other churchgoers. Oh, man. Okay, let's take the forced thing first of all. Gosh, I'm so sick of this. My expectations can't force you to do anything. Your expectations of me don't force me to do anything. Unless you've got a gun or a knife or something. You're not, and even if you do, then it's not your expectations that are forcing me. It's the gun or the knife or the whatever it is, you know. That's so. Can we please get past this? If you are doing things that you don't want to do or that you shouldn't do, or even if you like doing them, but you're doing them because other people expect you to act that way, you have a problem. It's called people pleasing, it's bad. You shouldn't be that way. God does not want you to be that way. Scripture is very clear about that. You don't live your life to please people. You live it to please God. Go talk to any psychiatrist or psychologist today. They'll tell you that it, that's a bad thing. So please, people, come on now. This is ridiculous. No one's forcing you to do it in the first place. And if you are doing it because you feel the weight of their expectations, you need to learn how to stand up and stop doing that, even if it makes you uncomfortable. And if you're a people pleaser, the most uncomfortable thing in the world you can do is stand up against other people's expectations, but that's exactly what you should be doing. And let me just say that real true worship should lead you to do that because you are bowing to God alone in Jesus Christ Therefore, I am rejecting the expectations of other people when they expect me to do things that God doesn't want me to do. 
And even if they expect me to do things God wants me to do, I'm still not doing it because of your expectations. I'm doing it because that's what God wants me to do. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, I, I, I just, <laughs> this is kind of, I guess this, this uh, episode's going to be kind of a rant in a way. Because these answers, they just touch on so many things that are just so wrong with us nowadays. And the ability to actually think logically that it just, people just, I mean, obviously any, any, well, any normal human mind can do that, but apparently we're not doing it. Second thing is, he says about this, your relationship with God, he said, quote, it may improve. It may stay the same. It may even disappear altogether. Unquote. Um, how do you know that your relationship with God is improved over what it was yesterday, last week, last month, last year, 10 years ago, whatever? How do you know that? Well, I think most people would say, well, I, I feel closer to God, so therefore my relationship with God has improved. Okay, great. Um, can you tell me what being close to God feels like? Because the Bible doesn't answer that question. The Bible never tells us what being close to God feels like. Now, the Bible talks about peace and love and joy and those kind of things, fruit of the Holy Spirit. But it never says, if you're close to God, you will feel thus and so. And if you're far from God, you will feel these things. So therefore, you should obviously then be trying to focus on the feelings that make you close to God. And the reason, several reasons actually, but the big reason I think that God never does that in the Bible is because you can be close to God and not feel any of those things. You don't automatically feel joyful in the presence of God, for example. If you don't believe me, go ask Moses how he felt at the burning bush. He was close to God. But he wasn't exactly feeling the way we think of being close to God, was he? How about the apostles on the Mount of Transfiguration? They were close to God, but they weren't having the kind of feelings we normally associate. Because we normally associate only good, positive feelings like love, joy, peace, others, with being close to God. But, you know, in the Bible, people had all kinds of reactions to being close to God, and not all of them were positive. So how are you going to tell if your relationship with God has improved? Okay, apart from Scripture, you can't. The only way you can tell that is by looking at what Scripture teaches, seeing what you're doing, and saying, okay, my life is changing. God is leading me onward. I'm stepping out in faith more. I'm doing this, that, or the other thing. And so my, you know, I feel like my relationship with God, therefore, has improved because you have some reasons to feel that way, not just emotions, which are transitory, here, now, gone, and in five minutes or an hour from now, and back again, and up and down, and over and around. I feel like I'm doing this podcast in, a, in the middle of a timpani section. Oh, man, I hope this doesn't sound as bad as I think it's going to. i um, sorry. So, yeah, this is really bad, 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 bad advice. And the final piece of advice here that we're going to look at today, I, I don't know if I should have picked more or not, but, you know, you can only take so much, people, is from Sean Murphy. Now, this was answered on May 7, 2019, and he has a note which says, Sean Murphy studied over 18 religions. Okay. So, he's apparently done a lot of research into religions. He starts off, This is what Jesus tells us about prayer and worship. Notice the and worship part there. So, let me start again. I just want to read it, and then I'll comment on it. Quote, This is what Jesus tells about prayer and worship. Matthew 6, 6, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Jesus did not say to go to church to find God. 
He taught that we need to find God in our heart and soul, not wear our belief on our sleeve. The best way to discover God and his laws is in nature, studying his creation. If you study his creation, you will find few churches that teach his laws. Religion and churches are man's creation, not God's. There is one important thing that Jesus told us about community to remember. When two or more are gathered in my name, do this in memory of me, Matthew eighteen twenty. So it is good to get together with like-minded people who believe that Jesus is our king and remember him. You do not need a church to do this. You can remember the Last Supper every time that you sit down and eat with your family. Close quote. Okay, so some of you probably caught right away that finally someone mentioned scripture and they butcher it. But before we get to that, let's start at the beginning and work our way down. You notice he says this is what Jesus tells us. He doesn't put the us in there, but I will, about prayer and worship. And look, I'm not going to criticize people for misspelling things on boards on the internet because we've all done it. So let's let's be nice. Let's be fair. Let's extend grace. Right? Right. Okay. But you'll notice he says that Jesus tells us about prayer and worship. And then he quotes Matthew 6, 6, where Jesus says, when you, you know, when you pray, enter into your closet. And, and, and when you shut the door, pray to your father who is in secret and your father, which sees in secret, will reward you openly. I, I'm paraphrasing it into modern English. Okay, that's prayer. Where's the worship? Uh, That verse doesn't talk about worship. Now, prayer can be part of worship. So in that sense, you could say it's worshiping, but it's just interesting to me that he's assuming this deals with worship when it really doesn't. Jesus here is talking about praying privately, not praying publicly to please people and get, to go back to our last answer, and to get their approval and to make yourself look spiritual and all that, which was a big thing, apparently, in first century Judaism. So he's misusing that verse, number one. Number two, he says, Jesus did not say to go to church to find God. That's right. He never said that. Probably because there were no churches when Jesus was teaching on earth. So it would have been a bit of a problem. (laughs) He does say that Peter is the small rock and that he's the big rock. And upon this rock, the big rock, I will build my church. So if it's Jesus' church that he's building through the apostles, maybe you might want to think about, you know, being there, maybe. Then he says this. Oh, here we go. Number three. He says, quote, He taught that we need to find God in our heart and soul, not wear our belief on our sleeve, unquote. Find me where Jesus ever said anything remotely like that. He did not. Jesus always talked about God as being all-powerful, being all present uh, and of being separate from us. When he tells us to pray, what's the Lord's Prayer? What do we do? We say, our Father who is in my heart and soul. No, we don't. We say, our Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Oops, I'm slipping back into King James. I memorized that in high school and it's still there. It's amazing. Uh, One of the very few things that are still there from high school. Um, Yeah, Jesus never said that you find God in your heart and soul. In fact, you don't. You absolutely do not. And this whole not wear our belief on our sleeve thing, Jesus said you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Don't hide your light under a bushel. Now, some people, depending on your age, you may not even understand the reference to wearing your belief on your sleeve. That's actually a... Uh, taken from an old saying or uh, slang expression, I guess you call it slang, where someone would say, oh, he or she, they wear their heart on their sleeve. What that means is you can, they don't hold back their emotions. You can see how they feel emotionally. They don't hide it. They don't try to repress how they feel, right? So if they're happy, they're happy. If they're sad, I mean, you can just look at them and you know how they're, what they're feeling, usually. So 
then he takes that and applies it to our faith. So he's saying that Jesus basically told us to not publicly display our faith, but to keep it hidden when Jesus actually said the exact opposite. I don't know what he was doing when he was studying his 18 religions, but apparently he needed to spend a little more time reading the Sermon on the Mount, which he quotes from, to know what he's talking about. Jesus never said those two things. Never. The idea of finding God in your heart and soul is flows much strongly, much more strongly out of Eastern religious philosophies than it does Christianity. And then he says... The best way to discover God and his laws is in nature, studying his creation. If you study his creation, you will find few churches that teach his laws, unquote. Okay, who says that's the best way? How do you know that's the best way? Is there any evidence that that's the best way? Well, he doesn't explain all that. So he quotes from the Bible as a source of authority when he wants it to be authoritative, He does not quote from the scriptures, some of which I've just referenced for you, when he doesn't want them to be authoritative because they disagree with his conclusions. And he certainly has a perfect right to have these beliefs, but they're not the same as what Jesus taught us. Okay. Now, nothing wrong with studying nature. I mean, you know, the heavens declare the glory of God. Well, the Old Testament and, and the Hebrews were well-known natural scientists. And yes, you can see a great deal of God in creation, but I, I don't know how studying creation is going to tell you anything about Jesus. I don't know how studying creation, by the way, is going to lead you to disagree with what most churches teach. I wish he had kind of elaborated on that, uh, but he didn't. And then he said, quote, Religion and churches are man's creation, not God's, unquote. Again, Jesus said, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. So the church is God's creation. That's a direct, straight-up, flat-out contradiction of Scripture. Whether he's aware of that contradiction, I don't know. And then he says, There's one more important thing that Jesus told us about community to remember. When two or more are gathered in my name, do this in memory of me, period, parentheses, Matthew 18, 20, close parentheses. Okay, so let's read Matthew 18, 20 from the ESV. Most of you already know this. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Oh, okay. Um, so it turns out, that he misquoted scripture and not just misapplied it like he did with Matthew 6 6. I mean, he just basically butchers it because he takes the first part of Matthew 18 and then, of course, he goes to the to the uh, verse where Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper and he says, Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. And he plugs them together. So that's very bizarre and just horrible way to interpret scripture or anything else. I mean, you can make anything say anything if you do that. If I can just go through anything anyone's ever written, cut part of their sentence out, go somewhere else that they've written something, cut part of a sentence out, put them together, well, yeah, I can make anyone say anything I want. So that's just not good. Then he says, um, quote, so it's good to get together with like-minded people who believe Jesus is our king and remember him. Unquote. Okay, that's good. I don't know how we got to the Jesus is our king part from everything else you've said, but if that's where you are at, if you really believe in Christ and are following him, then good for you. But then, here we go again. Um, He says, you do not need a church to do this. You can remember the Last Supper every time you sit down to eat with your family, end quote. Well, you could remember the Lord's Supper every time you do anything, so there's that. And secondly, I'm not I, I'm not sure what he means by that. It, does he mean you can have the Lord's Supper every time you eat with your family? Because he doesn't say that. He just says, remember the Lord's Supper. So I'm honestly not sure what he means. Um, 
So being charitable, let's just say that he meant to say, you know, that you can just have the Lord's Supper whenever you are with your family, which is true. And there would be nothing wrong with that if that's what you wanted to do, as long as you were doing it in the right spirit. You know, as Paul talks about in First Corinthians, you know, with the uh, proper frame of mind, with your heart in the right place, then that's awesome. So here's three, quote, answers, unquote, <laughs> to the question, going to church makes me uncomfortable, but I want a good relationship with God, should I just go? And I think all three of them were really bad, really bad answers. I'm sorry if that makes me an elitist or a snob or anything else. I'm sorry. But that those answers are horrible. I mean, well, they're not all horrible. The first one's not great, but it's kind of okay. And the last two are just, you know. So what would I say to that? Well, the thing that amazed me in these answers, and, and I read several others too, one of them was telling him to get into the cult of Saturn. And I mean, there was some weird far out stuff, but it's the internet. So, you know, you expect that. But no one asked him, what kind of discomfort are you feeling? How is this making, what is making you uncomfortable? Is it the music? Is it the preaching? Is it the people? Like if you're the only black person in an all white church, that might make you uncomfortable. If you're going to a church where they're speaking a lot of a language that you don't speak, that might make you uncomfortable. If it's the, maybe you're kind of a quiet, reserved person and you're going to a Pentecostal church where they're yelling and jumping around and that could make you uncomfortable. You could be a, a person that likes to be more demonstrative and if I dare say it, wear your faith and heart on your sleeve and uh, you're going to a Presbyterian or an Episcopal or a Lutheran church where it's the, all the liturgy and it's da 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 that might make you uncomfortable. I mean, there's a. You also go to church with the, where the pastor's preaching style makes you uncomfortable, or maybe it's what he's teaching. Maybe he's teaching heresy. There's a. There's thousands of things that could make you uncomfortable, and that question isn't answerable until you know what is making the person uncomfortable, and nobody bothered to ask that. It's mind-boggling to me. No one thought to ask that question back. But that's very common of a lot of people who don't know how to counsel and who have never really paid attention to how Jesus interacted with people is they don't ask nearly enough questions. Jesus asked tons of questions. And as I always say, he's the only man who ever lived who knew the answer to every question before he asked it and knew exactly what the people he was dealing with were thinking and feeling. And yet, he asked questions. So if he was asking questions, how much more do I need to be asking them? So there's all of that. So that there's no way to really answer the question without finding out more information. You just don't have enough data to make an intelligent response to that question. Um, and we don't have that. So I can't answer whoever wrote this question. Uh, his, I can't answer his question for him or her. But I can point out that in the Bible, worship is very often associated with discomfort and for sure pushing people out of their comfort zone. I mean, quite often. I have a few examples here. I want to read you. Let's start in Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Famous encounter Joshua has with the commander of the Lord's army. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell down on his face and worshipped him and said to him, Do you think Joshua was comfortable falling down on his face in the desert and worshipping this guy? I don't think so. Certainly not physically. Was Joshua com comfortable with the fact that he asked whose side he's on and the guy said no? <laughs> Which means he doesn't directly answer the question. Um, are you for us or for our adversaries? He just said no. Because he's on God's side, he's not on anybody else's side. And this is, of course, I believe this is the angel of the Lord. 
and which is Jesus, the the pre incarnate Jesus appearing in the Old Testament, and I believe that because Joshua worshipped him, and Joshua and the figure let him, the commander of the army, let him worship him. Angels do not accept worship; only God can be worshipped. So. Joshua worships and says, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. More discomfort. I live in the desert. Let me tell you something. If it was in the warm season, that alone could make you uncomfortable. The fact that I'm standing before this immensely impressive figure, I'm uncomfortable. The fact that I'm now standing on ground that is holy, that's also discomforting. Nothing about this encounter is comforting to Joshua. And it wasn't designed to be, I think. It's clearly designed to shake him up and to get him ready for what God is about to do because the way God took Jericho wasn't exactly comfortable for the people out there walking around blowing their horns for a week. So, should worship make me comfortable? Sometimes, but not always. Now let's shift to the New Testament. Because you can find things like other things like this in the Old Testament, but I think one's plenty. Acts chapter 13, 1 through 3. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, uh, Menean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying... They laid their hands on them and sent them off. Is that comfortable? I don't think so. First of all, for Paul and Barnabas, or Saul, I'll call him Paul, but you know you know what I mean. Um, they're probably excited that God's calling them to a ministry, but couldn't be real comfortable to just, okay, guys, we're going to pray for you. Let's fast. Let's pray. Fasting in and of itself not being a a real comfortable thing to do. And then send them off wherever it is that they were sending them off to. (laughs) They were like Abraham. They went off and they weren't really sure where they were going at first until God directed them. So I wouldn't call that real comforting. Exciting, yeah. Clearly stretching your faith, yeah. Comfortable, no. How about Acts 16, verses 24 and 25? They're in Philippi. They've preached the gospel. They've been arrested, because what else is new for Paul, right? Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. I don't think that was very comfortable. And I don't just mean physically. I mean being in jail and locked up and all that and all these people looking at you and I mean it's got to be a little weird it's got to be uncomfortable but they prayed and uh, sang hymns which indicates worship so no worship now the fact that they were praying and singing hymns to God may have comforted them if you're thinking that I think you're probably right so again I think worship whether it makes us comfortable or not depends on our needs because I don't need to be comforted every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. like clockwork. <laughs> Sometimes, at, that's when our service starts. Sometimes at 10.30 a.m. on Sundays, I need other things. So depending on where I'm at, it's going to depend on how the Holy Spirit is going to want to use the worship service to impact me, isn't it? Final example, Revelation chapter 1. It's kind of a long quote, but... Verses 10 through 18. Because you need to see this. Here's the Apostle John, right? He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So how you interpret that phrase in the Spirit, yeah, lots of different people will give you slightly different versions of it, but it seems to me clearly that he's worshiping God, he's praising God, that the Spirit is really in control of him. And, I, and, and, and uh, you know, he's clearly, the Holy Spirit's working in his heart. And I heard behind me a loud voice, like a trumpet, saying, Write what you see in a book, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. 
And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, obviously Jesus, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Kind of reminds you of the uh, transfiguration a little bit. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys to death and Hades. Now, what we see here is is John worshiping, powerfully under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And God, through this worship and through the vision that he sends him, makes him comfortable and uncomfortable. When he sees the figure of Jesus, all these symbolic representations of him there, you know, when he sees all of that, he fell at his feet as though dead. He was stunned. He was probably fearful in the sense of it's such a great, amazing thing. How do your brain can barely cope with it, you know, if it can cope with it at all. But then what does Jesus do? He lays his right hand on John and says, fear not. I am the first and the last. So John is made both uncomfortable and to a degree at least comfortable in this encounter with God in this worship moment. And remember, this is on the Lord's Day, so most people would say that's Sunday. So there you go. Worship, when it's really doing what it's supposed to do, may make you very uncomfortable. Then again, it might make you very comfortable. Or it might make you both. I've been in services where the music was amazing and it was great and I loved it and I felt really lifted up. And then I heard the message and it was very convicting which made me uncomfortable because let's just be honest. What is more uncomfortable than being convicted of your sin? Not many things, both in the same service. So worship should not make me comfortable. Worship should not make me uncomfortable. Worship should touch me where I live and worship should open my heart up so that God can do whatever he wants to do in my life in that moment whether it makes me comfortable or uncomfortable, excited or whatever, it doesn't matter. What matters is, is that I'm worshiping, as Jesus said, those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. As long as I'm worshiping the risen Christ in spirit and in truth, going by his word, letting the spirit touch and change me, then I'm good. And how I feel is not really that important because worship is far more than emotion whether that's in the more traditional kind of button down churches where you don't see a whole lot of emotion in the service or whether that's uh, churches where people are always jumping around and you got all kinds of emotion it, you know, it doesn't matter both of those kinds of churches when they take it to the extreme are missing the point because both of them are, are all about emotion one doesn't want any and one wants it all all the time. Well, all the good stuff. The loud, the powerful. The rah, rah. And there are some churches where you can be emotional as long as it's quiet. Quiet tears, crying. Rah, rah, rah. Oh, that's so spiritual. No, it's not. I mean, it can be, but it isn't all in and of itself. It's not spiritual. Emotions all by themselves aren't a mark of spirituality. The church has been buying into this thing that the world is selling us, this whole modern spirituality. It's all emotion. There's no content to it. There's no meaning to it. There's no purpose to it. And it doesn't last any longer than the feeling. Christian spirituality, on the other hand, is real. It affects my life. It makes me a better person. It flows from the Spirit of God and the Word of God working together, not contradicting one another. And it always results in a change of heart and mind and a change of action because that's what God wants to do. So that's the answer to the question. The answer to the question is not always. If you answer, if you ask it comfortable or uncomfortable, same answer, not always. 
So don't get caught up in your comfort zone. Drag your old fanny out of it. Stand up. Let the Spirit move you and do what God is calling you to do. And that's going to wrap us up for today and this episode of Disciple Up. I hope that uh, you got something out of what we've talked about today. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to know what you'd like to hear next. If you've got any questions, any comments, any anything, you can email me, louie, L-O-U-I-E, at discipleup.org. Or you can go to the Facebook page, facebook.com slash discipleup. Leave your comments there. And I really hope that you will share this podcast with your friends and encourage them to listen. Share it on your social media. Tell other people about it. I'd really be grateful. So until next time, take care out there, everybody. God bless you. And remember that every time is a good time to disciple up. So long. Disciple Up, the Empowering Disciples podcast is written, produced, directed, in as much as there's any direction of this thing at all, edited every once in a while, and paid for by Louis. It's his personal ministry, and it's not connected to Christ Church on the River. CCR does not sponsor, pay for, or necessarily approve the content found therein. The theme music for Disciple Up is Hot Wheels by Varensky. Yes, Louis actually paid for the rights to this very cool piece of music, so don't worry, and please call off the lawyers, as he's busy enough without having to deal with all that. All opinions expressed during Disciple Up are Louis and Louis alone. They do not necessarily represent those of our sponsor, the Lord Jesus Christ. However, where the opinions, thoughts, impressions, and feelings shared are in line with God's Word and faithfully represent what our Lord says in His Holy Word, the Bible, then they are representative of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're wondering how the heck you're supposed to know this, remember, God tells you to test all things. Hold on to the truth. It's up to you to do the due diligence that God commands, so do it. Don't whine about it, and don't complain about how hard it is. Don't blame me for it. Disciple Up and do what you know you're supposed to do. If you'd like to know more about Louis or Disciple Up, please go to discipleup.org and check out everything you find there. Or not, it's completely up to you. Disciple Up, the Empowering Disciples podcast will, God willing, publish an episode every week covering different areas of concern to disciples of Jesus. If that's important to you, then please subscribe on iTunes, Google, Stitcher, or another one of the many podcast aggregators available to you. If it's not, then don't. If you'd like to get in touch, please email Louie at louie at discipleup.org. God bless you.